Hi. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Tone Aries podcast. Before we get into it there, we just want to remind people that you know, we're supported through Danny Donovan at quickminutes.com. Mm. Yeah, Danny's a, a very good friend of both myself and James. He comes from the north side as well and he grew up locally and, <clears throat> you know, he's a, been a massive supporter of the podcast and both myself and James since we actually began and, you know, he's uh, he has his own company called Quick Minutes now and and quickminutes.com is a meeting management application for um, semi-formal and formal meetings. And look, if you want to know more about that, quickminutes.com and supporting Danny, supporting us. Um, so if you're interested in that, check them out and enjoy the rest of the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Two Norrigs podcast. I am your host, James, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Timmy's looking strong, isn't he, lads? Yeah, I'm sure I am, kids. That's great introduction, that, lads. Yeah. 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 He's up Sh- above. Sean is on the switch. I'll say hi, Sean. I found... I found the tightest top inside my wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. Timmy Boyle washes all these tops. <laughs> Spike O'Sullivan is in the audience. Why is Spike? Good man. And one of Spike's friends. Yeah. Is the, you're, you're the second of Spike's of Pascal's stable. Actually, you're the third. We've had Spike, Eric, and now yourself, Craig O'Brien from Dublin. That's right. You have a fight at the weekend. And yeah. uh, you all come down to Dublin. Thanks for coming down to us to share your story. You're a professional boxer and you're a youth worker and you're going through your degree at the moment. But you've got a background similar to myself and Timmy's. So before we go into what you're doing now, we go right back. Do you want to tell us where you're from, what it was like growing up? Yep, I'm Craig O'Brien. I was born in Dublin's northern city, uh, in Henrietta House, just off the back of Bounty Street there. I was born in 1989. There was four of us, four siblings, my mother and father. And it was actually a one bed and... We tap into a two bed. Is that, that was, inner city Dublin? That's inner city Dublin, yeah. yeah. So it was p- proper small flat. That was in 89 and we were there till 96 and my father bought a house in Mount Joy Street, which is a stone trail from Henry X Street. Yeah. And yeah, we bought we bought up there a bigger house. We all moved up there and I was about nine or ten when we moved up there. And yeah, we moved up. I started piling around doors. Actually, I would have, I would have, I would have grew up in Henrietta Complex, and which is only a, a little bit away. So we moved up there. Me and a couple of mates went up, and we started piling around doors. Actually, flats, mm. uh, and I grew up in the flats. Yeah, yeah. went to school in Brundig Street, which is just off North King Street, in the mm. primary school, and went to the secondary school there also. And had you got a mother around at the time? Mother and father, yeah. Mother and father around. Mm. Were you boxing? I was football back then. You'd be mm. just playing football daily because. It's all you knew yeah. in the flats complex. You grab a football after school. The first thing you want to do is play football. Mm. Last in the night, you'd be getting dragged in. Mm. You still want to play football. Know, you know what I mean? We had it. I was, yeah, I was, yeah. I could still kick a ball now. Did you play for a team? I played for St. Anthony's uh, as a schoolboy to be about from about ten to be about fifteen, and we literally, we literally won everything. We we, we good ballers. One of, one of them up front was uh, Christy Fagan. He yeah. ended up going to Manchester United. Yeah. And then he ended up back with St. Pat's yeah. and Bowles just only a few years ago. Yeah. And he retired. He's actually doing a physio now at the moment. And my friend Glenn, who grew up with me in Henrietta Street, me and him, was we done everything together. Yeah. He was on the left side, he was on the right side of the front, get those up top. But yeah, we won everything through the school boys. And school boys in Dublin is very competitive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've it, got Kevin's boys, St. Joseph's boys, you've got... The, 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 the Terry Archer was the big some, team back some, in the day. Some us. good teams. Yeah. 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 Wefta was another one. Yeah. Yeah, and then that team broke up then, and then <clears throat> we split up. Kitta went to home farm, and me and Glenn went up to Bowles. And yeah, Bowles was with the good squad, but home farm was just unbelievable. We, mm-hmm. we bumped into Kitta in the league, and it was just like beating Trey and Farnell. They were, they, they, they were oh, yeah. top class boys. Like, yeah. Do you know what? We have we have a problem here, and I'm say it's the same above in Dublin. Do you know, a lot of our talented sports stars, like footballers or boxers and stuff, from 50 they go up as far as 14 mm. 15 and it just like it stops yeah. because of alcohol and drugs come into their lives and yeah. they lose their their motivation and inspiration to go on and and, and get See, involved in the sport talent is only half the battle you know when you have a lot of obstacles yeah. in your way you need a discipline don't you you, you do but you mm. also need a bit of luck yeah. and like if let's say if you're um, a talented soccer player and you're from Loch mm. so that's where we're from and you're a talented soccer player and you're from oh, where where Spike lives, you know, with the big houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Posh but, park. but as an example, like you know, you're less likely to be exposed to criminality, to drug use, to trauma mm. and addiction and violence and all that stuff. But when you grew up in a in, in a in a state where you were, 
the t- you have the talent, you have all these distractions yeah. as well. You might be in a home where you, there's only your mum there and she's trying to look after four kids or maybe your dad is in prison or there's mental health issues in the home and stuff like that. So ch- young people from certain areas have a lot more challenges than others. Million percent, and, and and what Timmy said before he finished the sentence, I knew I knew yeah, what he was going to say. Had someone in your head, like. absolutely, because yeah. I've I've been that, and I say that nowadays. You know what I mean? And especially mm. through the boxing and mm. through the football, you see it, you see it daily. When you know what I mean, kids coming through the best of talent, and then just within them three or four years, it goes pear shaped for them. You're like, what happened there? You know what I mean? Mm. One guy up top of my mind, I, I won't name him. He, I call him the Yank. That's that, that's what his nickname as a boxer. He now, and he's he's won. Literally everything. Yeah, he, he went into like the senior championships at like 17, 18, and he was beating guys 25 and 6. Jeez. Yeah, and he was just top of the range, travelled all over the world with the Irish squad, boxed the best of Cubans, you name it. Mm. And when he went 22, 23, got caught up, mm. went to a 24th party, got caught up on the coke, mm. and one thing led to another. Now I still see him, he's 35, he's still yap all the time, he's tried to get back into it a number of times, but couldn't, but... Like if he'd have stayed on him and his career, he'd be so different. His life be so different there, to what it is now. Like there was a couple of friends. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Nice. There was a couple of friends of ours from our area: Johnny Kennelly, Stephen yeah. Manny, Good Spike. Boxes, yeah. They, they had probably fought you back in the day, Spike. Yeah. But they were very talented, and then they went down a bit of a different, a tough path. They're good now today, thank God. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But you think like what could have been? I know Manny box for Ireland as well. Like so. Um, yeah. You know, um, even the soccer, even some some fantastic good soccer, soccer players, as well. Yeah. I know, I know. Like the, we, there's a, one young player in particular there. Like he went, he was about thirteen and fourteen, going over to some of the big clubs in in, in right. um, not just England but also in um, in Scotland. And, Celtic. You know, going away and getting stoned the night before you're getting on a plane to go over and go on trials and stuff and. Um, there was a, a lot of young lads as well who would have went over and they got homesick, mm-hmm. you know. And came home. They stuff. were gifted and they just came home and they, they just kind of lost interest then because they knew that they couldn't be over there and and fulfil what they had, their dreams, you know, because their mammy, the Irish mammy, was back here. You know how that is like. And um, it's it's a terrible thing to see, isn't it? It is. And what James says, sometimes you need that discipline. Like sometimes you, 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 see, you, you see kids that probably aren't as talented as others. But mm. they stay in it, and mm. and a couple of years later, they're actually doing very well, or they're doing. And you're like Jesus, man, that fella was like twice the player he was, or twice the fighter he was, mm. and he didn't make it. But the difference is that little bit of discipline, mm. that little bit yeah. of being grounded and staying in the gym and doing your thing. Where the other fella, then, like you said, mm. messing around beforehand, thinking I'll do it next week, the next week, and then before you know it, the years just go by. You know what I mean? You had obstacles in your way as well in terms of you started dabbling with the drugs and stuff in your teenage years. What was going on for around that time and how did that come about? Yeah, well, I would have started boxing. I would have been brought down to the boxing gym by my father when I was eight years of age. That was in like 98 or so. And I would have stayed boxing and I would have had an amateur career of probably 80 or 90 fights up until I was 15 or 16. And then I just start, I was palling in the flats with the crowd, <coughs> not wanting to go training. And I mean, my dad would be like, we're trying to have six. I'd be like, yeah. I wouldn't be shouting up the house, he'd be coming around looking for me, I'd be hiding around the block, I'd be hearing him shouting for me, I'd be like, damn, I'm not here to the lads, you know? Mm. Knowing I'm not going to go trying to go back at nine o'clock, to be killings in the house, but you'd still do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, as time went on, I drifted away from it a little bit. I started wanting to be one of the boys, and wanting to be in the flats, and wanting to be involved and everything. And it's just, it's just part of the ground up as well, I suppose, yeah. you know what I mean? But, yeah, we, we started messing around the flats, we started drinking, probably smoking a bit of blow. Mm. Then one thing led to like sleeping pills. Mm. And there was a there was a group was there were probably thirty in the flats, but there was a group of four or five that would would take a few sleeping pills and a bit of blow and go off and do a bit of robbing and stroking and mm. came to the stage where we'd be out. I was like seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. We'd be out from early morning, out just out and about, just running through the streets. It's mad what the tablets taking stuff do. From yeah, yeah. Like. Do you know yeah. What the, what the, the sleeping pills and mm. the the relaxers? What they do? You don't give a shit. You don't. Full of confidence. You just you just do that and when when you're young, when you're that young as well. There's there's something about that age where you haven't got a worry in the world and you do whatever you want to do. You actually don't yeah. care about no one. Yeah. And it's everybody everybody has the best intentions for you. Yeah. And the best advice for you, like I understand, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. You're and still going to do what yeah. you want to do, aren't you? You're taking tablets. You don't you don't realize when that you're so loud when you're on them and you're full of confidence and all. It's only when you're a little bit sore the next day that you realize, Jesus, that was that wasn't me. You know what I mean? Cause trouble for you at home then. Yeah, because I like that change. I would have had a great upbringing. Yeah. <clears throat> my dad, my dad provided us with everything. My ma was great. You know what I mean? Uh, 
yeah, we, we, we would have had a great upbringing, but it was just, it was just, I didn't want to listen, you know what I mean? Now, I had a brother, Clint, who, he was, he was in addiction. He's still in addiction. He's 43 now. He would have been, he would have been on hard drugs and that would have been in the family home, you know what I mean? So, it's probably in hindsight that Clint was on it because I didn't, I knew the consequences then mm. if I ever touched heroin or whatever it be, you know what I mean? Because later on, I end up in prison and stuff and you'd see all that around you. Yeah. And I never, I never went near that, thankfully, you know what I mean? Because, probably because I seen the damages I done to yeah. my brother mm. and what was going on in the house, you know what I mean? But, probably with him being on on drugs, it probably took the eyes off me a little bit, mm. as in the sense I was able to run that a little bit freer and wilder, yeah. if that it's makes sense. You bring up a good point there as well, like, it, you don't always have to come from a broken home to end mm. up in addiction. Mm. You know, some people, like, have two solid parents, a stable mm. background, and they don't have the poverty and the mental health and stuff like that, but the, the, the child can still end up taking drugs and getting involved yeah. in st stuff mm. because they spend a lot of the time outside the home, especially when they come into their teenage years, you know, yeah. and hanging around the streets, and then when you're exposed to all that, and then it's like That's peer pressure and yeah. stuff. That's a great point, because sometimes it might be just maybe that child lacks a bit of self-esteem or a mm. bit of confidence, you know, or they just don't fit seem in. to fit in yeah. Yeah. to a peer group, and mm. peer group that they do fit into then yeah. are the lads, you know, and, they, and then in order to fit into that group, you have to take this, you have to do that, yeah. you know, to, for the boys heart, to get the respect, yeah, yeah. And it's, a, it's a tough, tough period of, yeah. of, of life, you know. I, I remember even even coming across ecstasy as a young child and, and, and what it done for me, the way it made me f feel, it definitely, definitely helped me to, to cope with, with, with this, the issues that were going on in my own life back then, you know, and um, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. It makes a lot of sense today why somebody would use something to get through that part of a life. Like when yeah. we get older, people use prescribed meds to, to be able to cope with their mental health today. Mm. Back then, was none of that. We, we use stuff like that as and, well. Like and to get as well, drop, when young fellas drop out of school, yeah. you know, the boredom as well, yeah. and the monotony mm. of getting up and not having nothing to do, the yeah. drugs, mm. they kill the time as well. Yeah. Well, where was your school? <clears throat> I was never great in school. I was there. Uh, so I would have left I would have left secondary school when I was 14 years of age. I remember because we joined the local FOSS up on Henry Street, and it'd be 15 to join there. And I remember they took me a week or two before my 15th birthday. So I would have fell out of school. I didn't know junior certain school. I would have done one or two subjects. We're in the first place I was in. I was doing a uh, catering up there. So I was doing the, the chefing up there. And I was there until I was about 18 or 19, probably 20. I still have a good relationship with some of the people up there, some of the workers that come and support me in my fights and that nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I was there for a number of years. So uh, no, school, school wasn't something for me. And even when I was in school, I was always suspended or sitting outside on my own or mm. from not being involved in the class and there was a group was there was actually you actually had one of them on your podcast uh paddy higgins oh, oh paddy, paddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so i listened to paddy joke it was great to hear it was great to hear about him i, I play uh, football now and again with his brother and i always ask how he is so you know paddy, Lindy. gentleman great paddy singer sound. as well great on the guitar wasn't he Gifted. brilliant, brilliant <coughs> singer we got so many requests from people looking to buy his cd mm -hmm. but he doesn't have a cd to, to, right. to sell but when he gets out, maybe yeah. he will. And you know, when uh, when he came on the podcast, Christy Moore wrote him a letter and sent it to oh, him. Oh, yeah. You can imagine Amazing, the books that would have given him. <laughs> Super, lads, that's uh, Great raspy voice. Yeah. Uh, because obviously, I, I, I listen to his podcast, I listen to a good few of them, and I see Paddy's name, I was like, Paddy? And I listen to it, like, fucking deadly, you know what I mean? <laughs> but Paddy would have been in my class, and they would have yeah. been like, oh, 20, 25, it would have been four or five of us that'd be all together. Yeah, yeah. And that just got me thinking as well, because there's Paddy, I was in prison, there's me, who yeah. I'm doing okay now, but I was, one of the guys died in a car crash from a robbed car, yeah. and then the other one or two was doing okay, thankfully, but, yeah. yeah, probably probably from not putting the head down through school, probably leaded me to be a bit wild then on the yeah. on the streets then as well, you yeah. know what I mean? You ended up in St. Patrick's. Yeah, so uh, when, when I wasn't going boxing, I was out, as I said, running the muck, we were getting involved in crime, robbing, stealing, and we were getting charge sheets, and eventually I ended up in St. Patrick's. I was about 16 or 17. Uh, I ended up there twice, one for four months, one for six months. And then, yeah, and then I got my last prison sentence. I ended up in Mountjoy when I was uh, 20. I was there at my 24th birthday. Mm. So that's 12 years now, man, yeah. Mm. yeah. And what, what was the turning point for you? How did you manage to move away from that type of life? 
I think I think uh, I think it was in Mount Joy because in Patrick's it was just like you know you know the way it is you hear so you're the prison and it's like you're, you're killed there, aren't you? <laughs> I know what that is. <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah. Made you it. Get <laughs> you know stripes on your shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's man? something you've strived for all yeah. in, in your youth. People are coming out yeah. you, oh, you're telling them yeah. I'm in prison. You know what yeah. I mean, man? But it wasn't until I matured a little bit. So I went through that phase when I was about sixteen. I was about twenty-one or two where I was in and out of prison. Not caring for no one, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Fuck the police, fuck the system, and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, before I went into prison, when I was 20, my girlfriend was three months pregnant. So I went in there and then I was there for nine months. And she was born in January when I was there. And I got out probably in March. So between Tasha having Halley, it gave me a little bit of like, yeah. something has to happen here. Something yeah. has to click here, you know what I mean? I might have been locked up my 24th birthday. Yeah. I might have been in for Christmas. I might have been in my daughter's birth, you know what I mean? My fourth child, so... When I came, I was doing a lot of training in there also. So as you know, there wouldn't be a lot to do. So I was either school, the yard, or the gym, yeah. and I was just mainly in the gym, probably twice a day even, and or playing football or the odd time going to the school. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I knew when I came out, I had to something had to happen. But even when I came out, I, I, I was still smoking a little bit of weed and I was still smoking a good bit of it. You know what I mean? I, I, I remember smoking good amounts of it. So I don't know where the changing point is. I know I went I, I, tr- through Tasha having the kid and going back to the gym on the outside. I went to the gym and the boys were lifting weights constantly and I was like, I'm just, the weights isn't for me, you know what I mean? There was a boxing bag in the corner, so mm. I started hitting the bag. Then I started skipping and we went to the gym, said of once a day, we're going twice a day, so I was getting more into it. I was less smoking mm. grass and getting involved in the outside. I was more in the gym, I was going jogging and eventually after six, seven, eight months, I left that gym, went to another local gym beside me, that friends of mine own that had boxer size classes, they got a boxing ring, they have all the facilities. And I went up there and I was going morning time, evening time, probably jogging. And then there was sparring sessions on the weekend. So there's people coming in sparring. And we're getting involved in sparring. And I was like, Jeez, I'm actually all right here. I actually, you had the talent I actually probably. still have it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, still, I still have it here. And we're getting fit in there. And then we're going sparring at the professional gyms. And we went to Celtic Warriors, which would have been Pascal's and Spike's gym. And we were out there sparring the likes of Spike and Luke. And oh yeah, I was sparring well out there. And I felt, I felt comfortable and I was like, Maybe this is something I could get back into. Uh, Pascal is Pascal Collins, Steve Collins' brother. He is, yeah. For the people that that might not be aware. But do you know when you um do you know when you were boxing like um when you were talking there it, it was a gradual thing moving away from that type mm. of a lifestyle. But over time you started to fill this your day with yeah. other stuff yeah. that was more productive, do you know? Yeah, absolutely. and that's vital for people trying 100%. to move away from that. Because if you're sitting around smoking yeah. weed, you're going in the back up on the sleeping tablets yeah. and back and try. Yeah. Yeah. If you com- com- continue yeah. that, you need something else: mm. education, employment, yeah. sport, family, kids, whatever. Yeah. So I would have, like, the, I call them bad habits. You know what I mean? As mm. in the sense, like I, I would have went into the flats and. I'd be staying with the lads for three or four hours and you'd be sitting there and you'd be rolling splits and you'd be talking, you know what I mean, just doing nothing, you know what I mean, that was just, and like you said, instead of doing that, I was actually going to an environment where I was training and I was feeling good and I was enjoying it, so the more i done that, the less I was in the flats and then I was with my girlfriend, the kid and then before I know it, over time, it just all changed, you know what I mean, and and you see it nowadays and I try, it's it's easier said than done, isn't it, because I try, I try to explain it to other kids nowadays, the young people where I woke up Dublin night, mm-hmm. you try to say like, if you could do this for two hours instead of doing what you're actually doing, yeah. It will benefit in the long run, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's, try, it's trying to get them to knuckle down into that. But you can see why people in NA, AA meetings and stuff yeah. in, in rehabilitation go to meetings and that because it's filling up the day, you know what I mean? It's around you with people mm-hmm. that's, in, that, that's on the same patch, you know what I mean? So, so when you went yeah. back training and the boxercise and sparring and stuff like that, mm-hmm. how did your fight come about or how did you get back into Was it a few amateur fights? Or? Yeah, well, it was actually, it was actually uh, so where we were training up in Livernoy, the lads was running, uh, a, it was over there the Homeless World Cup. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They were running a white collar gig in the Bolton Hotel on the south side, and they were training and doing the sparring up where we were. We were helping them out, and I was at, I was doing a bit of sparring as well with Tommy and Eddie, Eddie Hoyland out in Sagard, and I was sparring one of their lads. And they're like, "Listen, we can get you on as an exhibition on the show as a main event." So I hadn't boxed in years, you know what I mean? I was like, Jesus, you know what I mean? It's already done in the gym. You're going back out in front of the lights. Like, it's a little bit different. But I was like, right, okay. And I just rolled her, you know? And I went over and we we done an exhibition. we done three rounds. It was, it, was a, it was a brilliant night it was. And that was in 015. And then I would have I would have stayed training there and went out to Celtic Warriors. I was thinking with the lads out there doing Spartan for them, for their upcoming fights. And there was a show on in the Red Cow. It was a small, hard show. Tony Davos was running it. It was a... Uh, 
it was it was oh fifteen also, and I I went to Tony. Our son was out to Tony, and he's like, "Is there any chance of getting Craig on the show?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, the show is full up. I can't get him on the show this time." You know, so he's like, well, "Okay, I forgot about it." But lo and behold, someone got injured. I pulled out two weeks previous, and Tony came into the gym. He's like, "Ah, oh, Iron, how are you?" <laughs> he didn't want to know me t- two weeks yeah. previous. You know what I mean? Came in, yeah. What's the story? Uh, you can go on that show now if you want. He said to me, and I was like, "Oh, Jesus, man, you know what I mean?" But my coach was there. He's like, "Yeah, do it. Let's do it." You know I was fit, yeah. I was uh, back then. I was like fully training. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was fit then, you know. So, uh, yeah. And in the space of two weeks, I went and got medicals and got trainers and got me license and everything. And then before I knew it, I done a four round fight, professional fight, mm-hmm. in the red cow, and it was just the maddest fight and the maddest night ever. So it was your first fight. Yeah, four rounds. Oh, I'm like nervous. Twenty four rounds. It was just yeah. never. It was, yeah, it was never ending, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> and there was so many people there. I must have been like a hundred and fifty, two hundred people. And because of a small hall show, like this would be the ring, and there was no one at the side of it, so they were all nearly in the ring as well, you know what I mean? Everyone was fucking, I was hitting your man, he was hitting me, they were roaring and shouting, it was just, yeah, it was mad it was, but then that's, yeah, that's how it kicked off. Mm. What age were you? I was 25 then. Okay. Yeah. How many fights, how many professional fights have you had since? So, I've 13 professional wins, and I think I've 13, 12 or 13 professional wins and three losses. Mm-hmm. No, I've 12, so yeah, 15 fights, 13 wins, three losses. I heard you speaking uh, the other day, um, and it was around your most recent loss, where Pascal pulled you out of the fight, but it was a bit mm. premature. Do you want to talk to us about that and how you felt? Yeah, we went to Milan on a, on a big show, it was on the zone in uh, Italy, uh, October last year. Uh, me, Pascal, Spike was over there, there was a good crowd was over there. And I boxed this fella, no, no, me, 16 and now. We went to the way and we did, right? We were late for the way in, so we arrived and the Russian was up and you're next to the way in. I was like, right, okay, we're going to the hallway. And there was this guy facing me, big fucking huge fella, right? I was just seeing his back. I was like, Pascal, is that him? He's like, I don't think so. I looked around, it was him. I was like, how is he making light middle way? This fucker was huge, boys. Anyway, <laughs> went in, done the way in, I was looking up at him. I was like, fuck me, man, he's big. Next night, got in the ring, bell went, there was an eight-round contest, and I was, I was boxing on my skin, I was just oh. boxing on my skin, I had his number. He was lost in the fight, I could see it in him, as the rounds went on, every, everything he had, I had an answer for, you know what I mean? On the inside, I was like, he was strong on the inside, he's a big unit, but now I was, I, was, I was good on the inside, beating him on the inside, beating him on the outside. Everything was going with the plan, and he can't wear a big right hand, to be fair, uh, in the centre of the ring, I dropped my left hand, he can't wear a straight right hand, and I went back onto the ropes, and he jumped on me. Now, when he jumped at me, so I'm here, he's here, his back is to Pascal. So say you're Pascal, James, and he couldn't really see. He could just try and throw shots. But I was blocking and waving, and I was grand, like I was grand there. And then, as I, st- I caught him wearing an uppercut, as he st- I was like, I'll wait for him to stop, and I'll jump on him. So I caught him wearing an uppercut, and I turned him. But as I turned him, the ref put his hand in, and I was like, what's up? And he's like, the tail was on the ground. I was like, oh, no way, man. Mm, Pascal got the channel. Yeah, he was at the hit with his best shots. I was like, I'll have him now, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I was going to get him on the ropes and let my shots go. And I was just in that moment, yeah, if, if you see the video, I was like, for fuck's sake, I was gutted. But in hindsight, Pascal, I know Pascal years, he was looking out for me. He thought I was hooked, you know what I mean? Boxing, boxing's a cruel game, like, you know, people, last weekend was a fight in America and a guy got stopped in the eighth round and he, 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 I think he's still in the juice coma, you know what I mean? So it was very, I thought it was very noble the way you took it and the way you spoke about Pascal, thinking like, you were desperately disappointed and at and the day, but you know Pascal had your best intentions at heart, mm. and that that's very important for you mm. that you feel protected and you've a lie you've yeah. you've a loyalty towards him, and contrast it now with the anti Wilder. No, no, it's the world titles yeah, involved absolutely. there, but he, like he sacked his manager and stuff like that. He blood mm. coming over his ears mm. was in a way worse condition than you. Mm. He was after being dropped a few times, you know, and he got mm. like you could have easily sacked your manager, and people would be saying. Fair play to him, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you stuck with Pascal and Pascal stuck by you. But I feel like from meeting yourself, meeting Spike and meeting Eric, there's a there's something about you all. Like, you know, you're all nice fellas, I'd say there's a first loyalty amongst you all and you have each other's back all the time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and that that would have been last year, I fought for the four or five years previous, I travelled around the world with Spike and Spike's big fights with, with him and Pascal and the team, you know, and I've seen Pascal with commissions where I've seen other managers and coaches and they be t- the commissioner tell them this is the way it is and they just say, yeah, Pascal's completely different. Like, you know, he's mm. up there fighting against 15 blokes for his fight. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. If, if, if he thinks he's right, he'll let you know. Like, and just, just before we went out that night in the arena, the guy came in that 
works for one of the commissions and handles the gloves, passes like that's killed. He's like, where's the other opponent's gloves? Because they're meant to show, you know. Mm. He's like, oh, oh, he's like, well, where are they? He's like, oh, they're in the other, other dressing room. He's like, well, can you go and get them? And he sent the fella around the other side of the arena and he came back with them and he checked them, you know. So, yeah, I've seen Pascal. He, he, he looks out for us, you know what I mean? And as I said, in, in, in hindsight, he was he was doing it for the benefit of me, for my family. Like, it, it, it takes one shot, James. Mm. Yeah. And if I'd have got, if an extra two shots, even though, as I said, all you had him was about the tournament, even if another shot or two would have came, mm. it's that one shot that could have done the damage. Yeah. And, but... There must be he, some pressure on the coach as well, you know, because yeah. he's responsible for you as well, in one, in, in one sense, because yeah. if he feels the need to throw the towel in, to protect yeah. you because he like in, and as you said your mum was a beast as well as a big yeah. big fella but he was a you, you, <laughs> you, you knew that you had him but yeah. he probably thought like this fella's the heavy here like and I think I think I th and to be fair to Pascal then he was gutted even that night we went out I was like yeah. he went back to the hotel and I was like listen pop down you know what I mean he was feeling it and I think social media that's the other thing with live events social media blew up and was like yeah, well that shouldn't have been a stoppage you know what I mean it should have never done that and he came out the next day on social media himself and like was just yeah. explaining the situation mm. but yeah as I said I've been around past about five, six, mm. seven years and I know his intentions and mm. I've, I've a young family you know what I mean and yeah. life ahead of me and as much as we love boxing it's second to what we do you know what I mean exactly 100% yeah and, it's, and I was hurt and, and just on that I, I boxed in the O2 arena back in 018 and I, and I got caught I got clipped with one shot and I was gone yeah. And I was hurt that night, you know what I mean. And it was only when I came out of that TKO, I was like, you know what? You held your welt, man. You know what I mean. You, you think of, you you just see you just see knockouts, but this was a fucking devastating knockout. Mm -hmm. And it's like you held your welt, so I can I totally understand where he's coming mm -hmm. from. How does a, a boxer feel when they get knocked down? Like how 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 do you come back from it mentally, no, f and physically? How do you come back, right? <clears throat> yeah, there's the, the, that's one thing with boxing, like unless. Unless you may, whether there's highs and lows, if that makes sense, like yeah. he's 44 now, whatever he is, you know what I mean? But yeah. like the, the game we're in and the level we're at, like it's you, you're gonna get highs and lows, you know what I mean? Man, and I my first loss was that TKO, and I was flying before then, like I was like eight or nine and now I was at the win the BOI title and the Irish title, and the opportunity came out three months later to fight Anthony Fowler on a matchroom show, pay per view show, big event. I was like, lovely, I, I, I want this, you know what I mean? I went to pass, went past like Craig. You're on a good roll here. Would you not wait for probably 12 months? That's the experience, you know what I mean? Would you not wait for 12 months, mm. get a couple of more fights, and that fight would still be there if you... No, I was only 29 at the time, but I was like 28, 29. I was like, oh, I want that now, man. I could just see myself fighting there. That won't yeah. happen again. Yeah. But in hindsight, fast forward a few years, now I know with the experience, that would have happened. So maybe I should have waited then, you know what I mean? And let, and, and built more, and then had that fight. But I didn't. I went in the deep end. What a great fight for six rounds, an eight round fight. We both got off the stills. We went straight to the centre on the six on, on when the bell went in the sixth round and he went he fainted for the body and I went like that, but he came straight over the top and boom yeah. the chain. I couldn't I can't even remember. I was I was only when I view a back what, but what's your best win to this? Oh what's the standout moment in your career? Uh there's a lot of standout moments, you know what I mean? But maybe the Irish title I won uh live on T G four. There was like two hundred, three hundred thousand watching it. It was a ten round fight nice in, in the stadium with uh, army fans there, you know what I mean? So Maybe that was the highlight, mm. but maybe the TKO was was the low was the low point as well. Mm. But as I said, listen, it's highs and lows, and from where I came from, James, previous, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I'm winning in life, as in the sense, like yeah. you have a second life. Yeah, man. I, I, I only thing I used to think I was bleeding, getting up and taking tablets and running through the streets, and yeah. not not occurring in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. now I get to travel the world through boxing. It's been great to me, and yeah, we go again November nineteenth, and this could be this could be the last rodeo, and like, hopefully we get a good run of it in the. In the capital because we've been lacking boxing yeah. down south. Yeah, and uh, past few years you're in college at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in college. Yeah, in the past few years I picked up doing some. What are you doing? Well, I've done a level five in community addictions for drugs and alcohol with euros up in Ballymun, and then there was a diploma in connection with UCD on a level. It was it was a diploma for community drug addictions, and I done that. But it gave me a progression route when I done that to go into social policy and sociology. And I was like, you jumped, it's a three-year degree, but you go to year two. In UCD, is it? Yeah, in UCD. Mm. So it was a bit of a no-brainer to go for, you know what I mean? It's an extra two years, you know. And then college, yeah, it's great, man. It's a, 
Well, the four star was brilliant. The novelty, <laughs> the novelty, <laughs> still real. The idea of getting a degree is great. But yeah, the reality man. Is fucking hard work. Yeah, though. man. It's yeah. And it's full time, you know. But once you have it, you have it, and that's nobody yeah. can ever take it away from yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then you've even to fall back on after your career as well. Even coming to like at home, like I'm sure he's every. I'm busy. I'm constantly busy. With the, if it's not with the kids and going somewhere and here and I suppose he was like we come down to Cork and I was like, Do you know what? Going down there in the train for two hours and, tra- and two hours back, I might actually get a bit. Of, but I walked on the laptop, so I was doing yeah, the assignment yeah. on the way down today, and I'll, I'll do a how bit old, on the way back. How old are your, ki- your kids? Uh, I have four kids, so Hallie is 11, yeah. Craig's 10, uh, Darla is 4, and now it's 13 months. You know you know them looking at you now going to college? Yeah. You won't know, you won't understand the meaning of that until yeah. they get older, because they'll understand now that the next step in education after secondary yeah. is college. Mm. You know, and it be the most natural thing in the world for me. Exactly. Tomorrow. Like even my own mm. family, we never even finished secondary school. None of us finished yeah. secondary school. I, mm. I, I, your story is so similar to yeah, mine. Yeah, I went yeah. into you reach as well. Yeah. Um, at the age of, um, I've got thrown out of school at, in third year, and it's the exact similar. same way. Yeah, I had to go in there to get the foundation levels, the equivalent, just to get me over the line to do a trade. I was fifteen. Right. But when I went back to education and my daughter was looking at me and I was really focused and knuckling down and it was difficult now too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But the talk then started going on in the house. Yeah. You know, what are you going to... No, she's 15 and she's starting to save for her accommodation for college when she Amazing. goes. It's so amazing. I, it's the carry-on effect of it. Yeah. It's amazing. What you don't believe, what you're giving your kids is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and, and, and I think that changed because, uh, Timmy, mm. because like, obviously we... When we grew up, we didn't have responsibilities. Now we have yeah. kids, and, and I know what it's like going through them years, you know what I mean? And I said to Hallie, like, I was like, why can't I be when you're older? Trying to uh, implant, like, you know what I mean? A yeah. bit of college, a bit of this, but she's doing the dancing and she loves to dance, and so I think she might, well, she said she's going to become a dancer teacher, but I would love for them to do something with that, go through college, and cause education nowadays is, is the way forward, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? And you, you just hope that your kids have a good life. You know what I mean? If you get down the right path, because it's so easy to go down the wrong path, you know what I mean? It is, yeah. And and hard to speak as well. Like, you've lost a few friends along the way as well, uh, as we have as well. Mm. But it's just, you know what it gives you? It gives you a bit of, do you know what? A bit of gratitude for what you have today. When you have your family, you have your health, you're fighting a a professional boxer, you know, stuff you dreamed of. You're Mm. you're going to college, you've got a bright future. Whatever happens in the fight, you're going to do well for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And... Like, like Timmy said, the little the little fella he's doing football. I have him up doing boxing one night a week, and they're gonna come to the fight. If he, they they would have seen me on Italian stuff, but they're gonna come to the fight, and they're gonna let them carry a belt each into the ring and stuff like that. So it's little things like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's that's, uh, me. that's yeah, so amazing. Yeah, so it'll make that night, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, listen, it, it's good. Cool. It's great. It's good cool for them to see that, you know what I mean? And hopefully, uh, hopefully, as I said, as they get older, they yeah. follow. But you know, do you know when uh, when you've come through some hardship? I, I think of, uh, you know, when Eric Donovan fought there a few weeks ago, he won the EU title on uh, TG Cahill. Like, he was in a bad way in that fight, uh, you know, and your man hurted him badly. Mm-hmm. But he he wasn't, like, he, do you know, if he went down into the stool and didn't come out, we'd have all said, fair enough, we put on a great performance, mm-hmm. but you were badly hurt. But he gritted down on the gum shield and he just swung. And no, he said in his post-fight interview, I just said to myself, this is tough now, Eric, but just get through this and you never know what happened in the next round. You never know. And then that round was tough and then you never know. But eventually he turned it around. But there's a bit of that when you've come through the lifestyle that yeah. we've come through. It's like prison is shit, Patrick's, and the trauma and the addiction and all that shit, but you don't give up. No. You still, you yeah. go, go again. You go again, another sentence. Of, I'm at the fucking yeah. up again. Yeah. They get thrown out of school, you're back home, at the relapse and... But you go and you go and you go and I think you'll have that over your opponent. Yeah. You'll be yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, I, I relate to what you're saying. It gives that little bit of hard hardship, isn't it? You know, um, like a strong mind, you know what I mean? The, the toughness, because yeah. as you said, the experience through your life builds you, builds you off that. I totally understand where you're coming it's from. Like, it's, it's like, and we've often said this before, it's like Mike Tyson, right. you know, like he, he, he said he's someone to be a boxer. Do you remember he was saying that story? He's someone yeah. to be a boxer and he says, you can't be a boxer. Yeah. You had a cushy life. Your yeah, life yeah. was simple. <laughs> Imagine you going into a ring with a fella like me who was out robbing fucking houses <laughs> yeah. and robbing people at the age of 11 and 12. Yeah, absolutely. He says, no, you're not getting into a ring. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, 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 it's like, it's the toughness and the rawness and, 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 and it's just that, that little bit of 
anger and rage that we have from the yeah. real tough upbringing, mm. bring that into a ring. Mm. You know? Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, works, yeah, there's no doubt about works it. works an advantage as well, doesn't it? You, you do feel you have that, and you know what I mean? You can rely on that because, as I said, like all, all them experience being in tough situations and stuff, and where you are now, it's like you, 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 you can, I can relate to what you're saying. You know what I mean? remember Spike saying to us the last time, actually, when uh, Spike had his big fight, he, he's, your big, his big win over in America. Who was that fighter against Spike, you beat? You, you stopped him in America. What was his name again? Antoine Douglas, yeah. Mm. But Spike was saying to us that when he was sitting across, you knowing he's still looking at him or in the corner, when it was, mm. he said Spike would have been running up and down the hill up at the airport, which is tough hill in the freezing cold and the rain, doing chin ups off a lamppost. And he, when he was looking over there, and he was thinking, he's after been training in the sun over in LA. Like, yeah, 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 I yeah. know, he didn't go through what I went through, <laughs> yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? But you're going with that, that mentality, yeah. like he didn't have what I have. I've had a, I've had a tougher route to here, and it's going to show when it comes to it in the rings, you know. But the, it's psychology is you part of yeah, boxing, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, Be benefits you, like there's no doubt about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. You know, it's a great example of that, the Rocky movie, when you have Mr. T training in, in the gym in the middle of nowhere, and they're Rocky up in the fucking stage, and he, he's getting all the photographs done, and then he's yeah, taking a yeah, break, yeah. and he goes into Mr. T, and Mr. T pokes him all over the ring, yeah, he battles yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, doing the hard you know, training. And then he reverses that, and yeah. so it's... it's but there's yeah. loads of examples of it, um... Dustin Poirier training in the gym, and then McGregor's out in yachts, and then when they go mm. to the octagon, you know... You can't, you can't fucking, you can't relax on it mm. because the other, if you're not, yeah. if you're not trained the way you should be, your opponent is. Yeah, there's no so, shortcuts no. in the game. You know what I mean? Mm. When you go six in the morning, we look, I go about seven and go running that six. Yeah. But yeah, like you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. there's no shortcuts. You need to put it in because it all shows. You only get out of what you put in. You know what I mean? And, and I think it's like that nearly in all, all walks of life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, yeah, in business and sports. Yeah, like even college. Yeah, you look at college. Yeah. Like if like I could be like if, if if I was to study for an extra six four hours whatever a day, I'd be hitting A's A pluses. But realistically, I'm, I'm probably happy to be getting B's because I've so much going on in life. Yeah, but yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You only get out of what you put in. You know what I mean? So prioritize. Yeah, I'm trying, you're trying to balance everything nowadays. Yeah. You know what I mean, James? So Do you know if if I uh, said to you, um, if I gave you a crystal ball, what's your five-year plan? Where would you like to be in five years, or what would you like to have achieved in the next five years? And just in just in life or in, in boxing, in everything. Yeah, well, just to be healthy would be one. Uh, have a head of hair would be another. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to get a good run, a good run at the boxing. What's probably. the realistic goal for you in the boxing? Do you think? Probably an EU title. Yeah. Similar, similar to what Eric had, you know what yeah. I mean? There's, it, there's no reason why not if we can get shows on. As I said, it starts as a good, good card on now. The November nineteenth, it's sold well. Hopefully, we come back again mm -hmm. in March or April and probably get a couple of ten rounders and an international title fight or a new title fight would be brilliant. And then, I know well the rumor has it that Katie Next Taylor is going to Crow Park. That's yeah. a stone trial for my house. It'd be amazing yeah. to fight on that then as well. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, boxing wise is great, but yeah, just in family life, just to be good, kids to be good, everything to work out. Graduation. Mm -hmm. Graduation coming up next September. Yeah. Yeah, probably I'm doing, I'm doing two days, no yeah. chance. I'm doing <laughs> I'm doing two days work now, uh, with Salas and yeah. uh, in Dublin A. Hi to everybody in Salas. Yeah, yeah, and Troy, Target Response of Youths, that's who we that's who we started yeah. with. So they merged with Soy in Feb in February. So I'm over there doing fifteen hours, so maybe if I get my degree, I could bump yeah. up to probably twenty five or thirty hours. And you listen, the work will fall in the door for you. Yeah. And you know, doing stuff yeah. like this, you know, open media mm. stuff, because you've all the lived experience mm. and the academic experience. You'll have the the professional experience, and the organisation be happy. Will be, you know be lucky to have mm. you, and you'll get gigs. Talk, come in. Uh, can we get Craig to come in to talk in our school, our mm -hmm. club, our organisation? You yeah. know, there's our little things then, you know? Well, I, I, I try to give back, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. especially around, as I said, uh, my brother well, is a drug addict, you know what I mean? He's, he's doing well now at the moment. I, I would have lost a cousin to drink at 38 years of age. So yeah. I, I try to give back around that. It's TRP and Tala, Tala Rehabilitation. Yeah. I've done a box of size up there, volunteer work for 10 weeks there in the summer, you know what yeah. I mean? So... Yeah, I try to give back and try and, and, and try help them out when I can. Yeah. But yeah, the likes of all that work, it's great. It's something I enjoy doing. It's something yeah, I enjoy exactly. helping people out with. And hello to your brother. I hope he, hope he finds his way. Yeah, uh, Clint, yeah. He was yeah. up to me and Spike earlier in the car he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him, though. Player. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's doing well. He's doing well. I did so. a small bit of work with Canal Communities Drugs Task Force, which is up in Dublin Air as well. Some talks and stuff like that. So um, a lot of stuff going on in Dublin Air. 
Pleasure talking to you, Craig. Yeah. Thanks very best much. Best of luck for your fight. Pleasure, pleasure best of luck here. for your college. And uh, best of luck with everything. Yeah. And uh, we'll follow your progress over the next year or so. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a million, lads. Really appreciate it. Nice no to you. Yeah. God bless. Thank you. Thanks, boys.